Amen. Thank you, praise team. I'd like you to open your Bibles to the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 1. We were here last week. We're going to be here again this week in Colossians chapter 1, just looking at a few verses this morning. Specifically, we'll look at verse 4 and verse 5. Uh, but uh, I, I almost bought a tree this last week. We bought a house, and I was thinking about planting a tree, and then I saw some of the prices, and I'm like, I think I'll hold off for a little while, right? Uh, in Florida, where I grew up, uh, we have orange trees, and I would have loved to have an orange tree in here, um, you know, a little one before it produces and all that stuff. But a strong and healthy orange tree will produce... Yeah, let's try that again. A strong and healthy orange tree will produce... Oranges. Amen. A strong and healthy orange tree will produce oranges. You take water and sunlight and right soil and all these things and photosynthesis happens and all, you know, all of a sudden you have oranges, right? It's because a strong and healthy orange tree will always produce oranges. Well, the same is true for a strong and healthy church. Not that we produce oranges, but we produce fruit, right? There are certain things that happen in a church that produce fruit in the life of the individual believer as well as the church as a whole. And so I just want to look this morning at this question. What does a strong church look like? What makes it up? Just like a strong and healthy orange tree has water and sunlight and right soil and all those things, there are some ingredients in a healthy and strong church that we need to look at this morning. And it's found in Colossians chapter 1. And I'm going to read verse number 1 and through verse number 5. It says in chapter 1 of Colossians verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. First of all, who is he speaking to? Paul is speaking to the church, right? Specifically to the church at Colossae. And he's also, by way, speaking to you as a believer this morning. And who is speaking through Paul but God? Amen? All scripture is inspired by God. He continues in verse number three. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Now listen to verse four and five. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we ask that you would speak to us through your word. We ask, Lord, that you would just take over and that your spirit would speak directly to every single heart that hears this message. God, I ask that you would be honored and glorified and that we would have our hearts open and ready to hear from you. Lastly, Lord, if there's someone here who has never trusted in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, Lord, help them to know that they cannot work their way to heaven they can't do enough good things. It's simply by grace, through faith, that they have eternal life through Jesus Christ. We pray they would put their faith and trust in Jesus and what he did on the cross today. And that today you would change their eternal address from hell to heaven. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So what does a strong church look like? The first thing is this. A strong church has incredible faith. When I was writing my notes, I first put... A strong church just has faith, but a strong church has incredible faith, amen? It's not just okay faith or good faith. No, a strong and healthy church has incredible faith. You see that in verse 4. He says, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. We spoke on this a little bit last week. We spoke about specifically faith in Christ. It has to be faith in Christ, not just faith in faith. Or faith in God, but faith in Jesus Christ. Now you have to understand a little bit of the context of what's happening here. So everybody go ahead and turn on your brain this morning. You ready? Put on your thinking hats, right? All right. We're going to dig just a little bit deeper this morning into this passage. You see, the heresy that was intruding the Colossian church was a mix of asceticism. Luke's going to come up and give me a definition of asceticism. You ready, Luke? Not so much? All right. Asceticism was basically this thought process that the flesh was evil, that all flesh was sinful. And so they tried to do a couple things to, to make that uh, reconcile with God. One thing they did was they said, let's be as perfect as we can be. And they went to extreme, and we know that, we know that as legalism, right? 
can't do this, can't do that, can't do this, can't do that, right? And they tried to live by all these laws, and of course it didn't work. But the other side said, you know what? We should just do whatever we want. Our flesh is evil anyways, it's sin anyways, and so they indulge in all these different types of sins. So this was part of the false teaching that was happening in the Colossian church, but also there was another type of teaching that was invading, and it was from the Jews in the Colossian church, the former Jews who had come to Christ possibly, but they were saying, well, now you have to do this. It was legalism. It was saying, now you have to be circumcised. So that's the context into which Paul is writing. And I say all that to say this. Point number one is a strong church has incredible what? Faith. 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 And that's what Paul's point was to them. It's by faith. It's not by the flesh. It's not by works. It's not by anything else. It's simply by faith. And they were to walk by faith just as they had first believed in faith in Christ Jesus. That's how we're to walk as believers. Amen? By faith, not by works, by faith. You see, our Christian lives begin with faith, and then we are called to continue in faith. You say, well, Dave, what's faith exactly? Because you hear a lot about faith today. Faith is a relationship. If you want to boil it down to the basics, faith is a relationship. Now in your notes, I know that you have a few things there. It says, faith is trusting in a person, not a religion. If you're trusting in church attendance, or trusting in your good works, or trusting in Christianity as a whole, that's not faith. Faith is trusting in a person. And who is that person, church? It's Jesus Christ. No other person other than Jesus Christ. Faith in Christ. And Paul, that, Paul makes that clear to the Colossians in this text. You see, faith is confidence in the character of God. Amen? Amen? It's faith in who God is. And faith is acting in spite of my feelings. So, you take that combination. What is faith? It's a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Not just for salvation, But day by day and even moment by moment, you're trusting in a person, not a a religion, not a church, not an organization. Faith is specific to a person and that person is Jesus Christ. And then it's confidence in knowing who your God is, right? I love having Greg up here playing and next week I'm looking forward to him and Linda uh, joining us and, and leading us in worship. I've only known Greg and Linda a couple weeks, but they seem like great godly people. But you know, I don't know that I would trust Greg and Linda with my life right now, because I've only known them for a month, a month and a half, right? I would trust, Miss Corinne, I'd trust you a little more if I said, I need you to catch me off the stage. Now, Now, Greg's stronger, so I'd probably go with him. But you see, your faith is only dependent on how much you can trust another person, right? It's the same thing as true with your relationship with God. The more you know of God, the more you will trust in God. It's that he is who he said he is, and that he will do what he said he will do. The more often you act on what you know of God, the more you will grow as a Christian. Amen? The more often you act on what you know of God, the more you will grow as a Christian. And how well you know God will determine how well you trust God. This is vital to understanding what it means to grow as a believer in Jesus Christ. We've got that picture of the muscle up there. Just like the physical body needs to be strengthened, the spiritual body needs to be strengthened. And there is a process to it. And it begins with faith. You see, a growing and strong believer will produce the spiritual fruit of faith. Even when things get tough, even when things don't make sense, even when things seem to be falling apart, a strong believer walks by faith. Same for a church. Many things happen in the life of a church that require great faith. And a tested church, just like a tested believer, results in a strong church. And a strong believer. If, there's a big if, 
if you allow it. You see, most of us walk through life and we get to the trials and we get to the temptations and we get to the hardships in life and we just say, why God? And we stop there, right? Maybe we don't hear an answer instead of walking by faith and saying, you know what? I know who my God is. I know that he is a good God. I'm going to trust him in faith. And then when you see him come through, it builds your spiritual muscles. And you grow and grow and grow as a believer. Which leads me to my next point. Faith is a muscle. Everybody give me your best, Arnold. Come on, Tom. Let's see him. All right. Oh, that was good. Get down, get to the chopper. Do it now. Arnold Schwarzenegger, you think about his muscles and how much he had to train. Well, you know, faith, your spiritual faith is a muscle. Just like you train your physical body, your spiritual body needs this as well. James chapter 1, verses 2 and 4 says this. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Let's just break this down for a moment. Listen to this. Knowing what? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. So he says, consider it all joy. That is, he wants you to be happy. He wants you to have joy. He wants you to be excited. When? When you encounter various trials. Does that seem odd to anybody? It's difficult, isn't it, to be happy, to be excited, to be, oh, I got a flat this morning. Praise God, right? Oh, no, I've got test results back that are not good test results. Oh, no, we're not going to be able to pay this unless God comes through. He says, listen, in those situations, in the trials of life, you are to be joyful and happy and excited. Why? Because knowing, what a great word. Not guessing, not thinking, well, maybe No, knowing that this test of your faith, whatever you're going through, it produces what? Endurance or patience or like a marathon runner, right? Anybody ever run a marathon? Raise your hand. Me me neither, okay? Half marathon? Anybody ever done a half marathon? All right, Marty. You had to train for that? Yeah. You have to train for that. And maybe Marty started out with a mile, right? And he got good time in a mile, and then he went to three miles, right? And then maybe he went to five miles, and so on and so forth, until he could build up his endurance. But how did he get that endurance? He had to be tested. His body had to be tested time and time again, running longer distances, going through the cramps, wanting to stop, and instead pushing through, right? Pushing through and pushing through. That's how your faith is strengthened. When you push through the trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And then look at verse 4. And let endurance have its perfect result. What is the result? So that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That phrase, perfect and complete, it simply means mature. That you would grow up and get strong in your faith. Every trial that you're going through in your life. Every circumstance, every hardship, every heartbreak is an opportunity for God to strengthen your faith. Once you understand that as a believer, it allows you to grow as a believer, to become strong in the faith. You see, the more you trust by faith, the stronger you grow in faith. Amen? Amen? The more you know God, the more you trust God. You say, Dave, you're repeating yourself. You will never grow as a believer until you get this principle. You will never begin to mature and grow strong in the faith until you understand these basic, basic principles. So let me ask you this morning, because every one of us has something. And there's something that's probably already come to your mind this morning. What has God allowed in your life this day, this week, this month, or this year to test your faith? You say, well, Dave, there's really nothing in my life right now. Well, did you just come out of something, right? Guess what? If you're not in something and you didn't just come out of something, you got something coming, right? Because God is constantly testing our faith. He's constantly allowing things to happen in our lives to build our faith, to strengthen our faith. And it's up to us. We have the decision whether or not we will build our faith or not. 
See, a strong believer knows that testings are simply an opportunity. Everybody say opportunity with me. Ready? Opportunity. Your trial in your life this day is an opportunity. A strong believer and a strong church has incredible faith. But secondly, a strong church has incredible love. Amen? Amen. Now there's a specific correlation here. If you look at verse number 4, he says, Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. And then he says... And the love which you have for all the saints. You see, the two are joined. They're not mutually exclusive. Genuine faith produces specific love. I need you to say that this morning. Genuine faith produces specific love. One more time. Genuine faith produces specific love. If you have real faith, like these Colossians did, and Paul was speaking to the real believers, the the real people who trusted in Jesus Christ by faith, he said there's going to be something that shows up in your life. And what was it? Bonus points for this. What would show up in their life? Four-letter word starts with L. It was love. But it was a very specific love, right? Right? Because genuine faith produces specific love. Just like an apple tree produces, just like an orange tree produces, just like a banana tree produces, just like a watermelon tree. Oh, no such thing, right? No, watermelon, good job. You see, the fruit. The the tree that that has a fruit, it's going to produce that specific fruit. Well, the specific fruit of the believer in Jesus Christ is love, and it's even more specific than that. He says, your love, look at the end of verse 4, and the love which you have for who? Your neighbor? Nope, that's not what he says. Family? Nope. He says, for all the saints. The genuine believer, the genuine person who has faith in Jesus Christ and is walking by faith in Jesus Christ will produce love, but it's not just love, it's love for other believers. And specifically, it's for the church. So we're talking about strengthening the church, the church getting stronger. The way that the church gets stronger is by faith. And then that faith produces love amongst the believers. Matthew 7, 15 through 20 says this. It's a little small, but it's on the screen. It says, beware of the false prophets, Jesus is speaking. He says, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their... You will know them by their fruits. You see, grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears Bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their, one more time, church, fruits. If you have faith in Jesus Christ, you've had that moment in your life when you said, I'm a sinner, I need a Savior, and you've turned from yourself and your own works, and you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross, then if you're walking by faith, you will produce the fruit of love, and specifically, love for the saints. How does genuine faith produce love in the New Testament? Just a quick guess. Anybody want to anyone want to just give me an answer of give me a New Testament command. Anyone you want. A New Testament command. Anybody? Love one another as I have loved you. Perfect. Thanks, Miss Corinne. What else? Any, anything else? Feed my sheep, Jesus told Peter, right? If you love me, feed my sheep. What else? Give me another New Testament command. That you have love one for another, right? What else? Give me some more. You want me to give you some? Say yes. (laughs) Yes, I was waiting for this part. Be at peace with one another, okay? Devote yourself to one another. Let's just stop there for a second. 
devote yourself to one another. I am devoted to a sports team, right? I give them my time. I give them my money by buying their merchandise. I spend time. I would spend time with Jim Kelly all day if I could, all right? Because I, I, I want to be a part of that. And he says, devote yourself to one another. That is, devote yourself to the church. Devote yourself to the saints. Devote yourself to the people of God. That's another command. Honor one another above yourselves. Serve one another. Be kind to one another. Be compassionate toward one another. Forgive one another. Now, again, all of these are in relation to who? Not the world necessarily. Not that we shouldn't do these things to the world. But his primary focus is the church of God. It's your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's the people who are sitting in here right now. Now you say, well, what does that have to do with faith and love? You see, when a, when a believer acts by faith, the result is love. Always. Always. Let me give you an example. You have a beef with somebody in the church. They stepped on your shoe, right? How dare they step on my shoe, okay? <laughs> and they never even said sorry, right? They hurt your feelings. You feel like they've sinned against you. And the command in Scripture is what? Forgive one another. Now, I'm using a silly illustration, but we do this all the time in the church, right? I mean, let's take another command. Have compassion towards one another. Somebody in the church is going through a financial hardship. Serve one another. That is, use your spiritual gifts. You see, when you act in faith, in obedience, and you say, okay, God, I see the commands in the New Testament. I see what you want me to do in relation to my brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. I see that you want me to be at peace with them. I see that you want me to devote my life to the church. I see that you want me to honor them. I see that you want me to serve them. I see that you want me to be kind to them. I see that you want me to be compassionate to them. And I see that you want me to forgive them. And we could keep going on and on and on with all the commands. It's it's not enough just to know the commands, to see the commands, to hear the commands. The next step is to take that step of faith and act on what God is telling you to do in the New Testament. Once that happens, love is produced. 100% of the time, when you step out in faith, it produces love. Why? Because God will never, ever, ever tell you to do something by faith without it resulting in love. It will always result in love. You say, Dave, prove it. All right. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Now remember, we're speaking in the context of the church here, okay? Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Paul says what? So I say, say it with me, church, walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So here's a command for every New Testament believer. If you've trusted in Jesus Christ, you are called, just like you were saved by faith, you are to walk by faith in the Spirit. So I say, walk by the Spirit. Have you ever asked yourself, how do we walk by the Spirit? I remember reading this passage when I was about 12 years old. And I remember thinking, how do I actually do this? I don't understand how to actually walk by the Spirit. What does that mean practically? What do I have to do? Because I want it so bad and I still desire in my heart of hearts to walk by the Spirit. If you desire to walk by the Spirit, would you say amen this morning? Amen. Now I'm going to tell you what the Bible says, how we are to walk by the Spirit. The first thing is this. It's by faith. How do we walk by the Spirit? By faith. You say, Dave, you're being redundant. <laughs> it's on purpose. It's by faith. And then what happens? Walking by faith in the Spirit, he produces fruit. You see, you have to take the first step. Maybe there's something in your life. I just think about Justin and Christy Cunningham who came all the way from Battlefield, Missouri. How many miles is that, Justin? About 1,300, 1,200? Oh, 700. That was way off. 700 miles. Moved him and his four kids halfway across the country by faith. Not all the details have been ironed out, right? 
But by faith, they decided we're going to obey God and what we believe he's calling us to do. They literally were walking by the Spirit moment by moment. And then the Bible says when you do that, it will produce fruit, just like our orange tree will produce orange. How do we walk by the Spirit? By faith. Walking by faith in the Spirit, who produces fruit? It's not us. We don't produce the fruit. You see, anything that you do in your own flesh is going to be burned up. Wood, hay, and stubble, the Bible calls it. Everything that you do as a believer will be tested by fire. It will be refined. And only the things that are done by faith. The Bible says that, God says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For those that come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So much truth in that passage. Those that come to God, those that come to God must believe that God is. Do you hear it? you got to know God. The more you know God, the more you trust God. Those that come to God will believe that he is and that he is a what? A rewarder. Your faith is not going to go, whoa. God's going God's to put that plank in front of you. He's going to put that next step in front of you. When you take that step of faith, those that come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So how do we walk by the Spirit? By faith. Walking by faith in the Spirit. He produces fruit. And now listen to this. This is big, big, like Mike said this morning in Sunday school, gold star times three, right? Three gold stars. You ready? As we walk in the Spirit by faith, what does that produce? Let me, tell, let me say it like this. The fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5 is... Ooh, stop at the first one, Annie. The fruit of the Spirit is... Say it real loud for me. The fruit of the Spirit is... That's not by accident, folks. Genuine... Faith will produce love every time. If you don't love this body, you're not walking by faith. If you're not loving the other believers in this church, and this is just something you do on the weekends, you're not walking in the Spirit. Don't kid yourself. God has called us to walk by faith, and genuine faith produces specific love. Love for the brethren. Love for the brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. I want you to hear verse 8 because it confirms it. Verse number 8 of chapter 1. He says, and he also, he's speaking of Epaphras. It says, and he also informed us of your, listen to this, how beautiful. Love in the spirit. When you're walking in the spirit of God, you can't do anything unloving. You say, Dave, I have a hard time loving unbelievers. I have a hard time loving those people on that one news station. I have a hard time loving those other people over there. Not if you're walking in the Spirit. And specifically the church of God, you will produce love when you are walking by faith. The Spirit will produce the love of Christ in you. You see, a strong believer and a strong church has incredible love. Do you want incredible love? Amen? If you want incredible love, you have to have incredible faith. You see, a strong believer in a strong church has those things. Let me ask you this morning as we wrap up here in a moment. This is a short message because next week there's one word that I want you to look at in verse number 5. He says, actually let's back up in verse number 4. He says, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus... And the love which you have for all the saints. And then verse 5, listen to what he says. Because of the hope. We're going to talk about that next week. Do you need hope in your life? And all God's people said, Amen. every one of us need hope. And I can't wait to dig into this. And it's all predicated around faith and love. Isn't it odd that Paul constantly talks about three things? What does he talk about? Faith. Hope and love, right? Next week we're going to wrap up with hope. And I want to encourage you. If you need to be encouraged, you need to come next week and just bring somebody that needs hope. I know you know someone out there 
that needs hope in their life. And next week it's going to be so good I can't even wait. But today, let me finish with this question. Is your faith, not your neighbors, not your parents, not some other person in the church, is your faith producing love? If it is, hallelujah. If it's not, we need to start walking by faith. Amen, church? Would you bow with me? Father God, we thank you for allowing us to dig into your word. We thank you for speaking to us. God, I ask that we would be a church who has incredible faith. That we would be a church who loves you and loves other people because of that faith in you. God, I ask that we would understand these basic, basic principles of the Christian life. Help us every time a a trial comes, a test comes, a difficult circumstance comes, that we would remember and dig into your word about who you are and see your character, and then we can lean on you. God, we sang that song this morning, leaning on the everlasting cross. Father, leaning on you, leaning on Jesus Christ. Help us to do that. I don't know what people are going through this morning, but I know they're probably going through something. Help them in their life to lean on you, to trust in you, to believe you for it. And God, help them to see that you will produce by your spirit when they walk by faith in your spirit that you will produce love in their life. If there's no love, there's no faith. Help us to simply obey you, obey you this morning. We'll give you the praise and the glory. In Christ's name I pray, amen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name.